Hey, it's Jack, host of the show. A few years back, I went to Silicon Valley to do some training. While visiting, I decided to visit Google. I didn't know anyone there, and they didn't know I was coming. I just wanted to, like, park and walk around the building and see what it looked like. A co-worker and I used Google Maps and found it. There it was, the main headquarters for Google. Actually, they call it the Googleplex. The place where emails are stored, browsing history, map locations, it's all there. Not to mention the source code for so many products, too. And if that data isn't in these buildings, the people who work in these buildings have access to that data. So we find the place, we pull into the parking lot, no guard gate in the parking lot. Cool. (laughs) We park the car. And as soon as I get out, there's a bunch of bicycles just parked everywhere. No chain or locks. And these bikes are all super colorful. Red seat, yellow body, green fenders, blue handlebars. I've heard about these. These are the free G-bikes. Googleplex is so big and employees need to get across the campus. So they put these free bikes everywhere for employees to ride. And I have no idea why every single bike isn't stolen every night from this place. But whatever. My friend and I walk past these bikes and up to the Google offices. The campus reminds me of a university. Instead of one giant office building, it's many smaller buildings spread out all over the place, with sidewalks going everywhere. We walk onto the campus, between some buildings. We get among the buildings into a courtyard. There's a sand volleyball court with a game being played right in front of me. And I can see across the street there's a Google athletic field where a soccer game is going on. There are people on Google bikes just whizzing by us, and we found a giant android robot statue. I took a selfie, and we hung out on the campus for a minute. A lot of engineers and technical people were just walking on past us. I wondered what they did. Security seemed non-existent. I I decided to go into one of the buildings, so I followed someone inside an office. But it didn't matter, because there was no badge reader or security to keep me from just walking in by myself. It was weird. It was too easy, like I was walking into a trap or something, so I just turned around and walked out. I went into another building. This was a cafeteria of some kind? It seemed like there was free food for employees, and I don't know, but it seemed like anyone could just walk in and grab a burger. The experience was wild. I've never seen a corporate environment like this before, and it made me question my lame office job. But it was super fun to visit the Googleplex. The next day after training, because we had so much fun at Google, my friend and I wanted to go to the Facebook campus to check it out. Google Maps made it look like the campus was in a similar style. Eleven buildings, all spread out, with a central courtyard and sidewalks everywhere. We cruise on into the parking lot. No fence or guards to keep us out. Cool. We park. And here at Facebook, we see a ton of blue bikes. Just like at Google, these are free bikes for Facebook employees to use to get from building to building. We decided to try to go into one of the buildings. We walk on up, grab the handle, doors unlocked, right on. We go in. But immediately, a security guard asks us what our business is. We say, uh, we're just here to use the bathroom. She tells us no. And to leave, there's no restrooms here. We beg her to use the restroom, but she says no, we have to go. We decided to walk around the buildings and try to find a way into the center courtyard. But this campus is a little different. Between each building is a high-security fence, keeping you from going into the courtyard. We go around to the next building, same thing, big fence, locked, can't get in. Next building, another fence, locked. At this point, I'm becoming really curious what's in their center courtyard and amongst their buildings, and I want to get in and see it. So I say to my friend, okay, the next gate we get to, if it's locked, I'm going to just wait there and tailgate someone in. He says okay and waits for me down at the end of the sidewalk. I stand near the gate, looking at my phone, trying to be inconspicuous. Someone comes up to the gate. They swipe their badge. The gate opens. I follow him into the courtyard. Yes, it's working. I close the gate behind me. Then I realize I'm trapped. To get into the courtyard, there's another gate. You need to get through two different gates to get in. One uses a badge and the other uses something else. And when the guy ahead of me saw that I tailgated him in, he quickly went through that second gate and closed it behind him. I was now stuck between the two gates. I couldn't get into the courtyard because that gate was locked, so my only option was to go back out, the same gate I came in. So I did. Security of Facebook thwarted my half-assed attempt at getting in. Not bad. But if I was a professional social engineer, I bet this would have gone down totally differently. These are true stories from the dark side of the internet. 
I'm Jack Resider. This is Darknet Diaries. Today, we're going to hear from a social engineer named Jack Hyde. So my name is Jack Hyde, and I am a physical penetration tester and social engineer. I work with a red team of technical hackers, and I gain physical access to buildings so that we can use that access to exploit their, maybe it's personal information we're after, or credit cards, stuff we shouldn't get our hands on. Yep, yep, you got it. Jack Hyde is going to share a story with us about how she broke into a building. And I always think it's fun to tag along with these kind of stories and listen to what their job is like. So Jack Hyde is her hacker name, you could say. Kind of like a play on the whole Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story. One person, but two different personalities. But Jack wasn't always doing this kind of work. So I actually was introduced to this line of work while I was working as a journalist, I, I studied journalism in, in Dallas and I got involved with the Dallas hackers community because they were making some waves. And I was introduced to the concept of penetration testing first. And then a friend told me about physical penetration testing. And I was like, you get to break into buildings for a living? That's crazy. And he was like, yeah, well, I don't, I don't particularly like to do it. Like it's, it's nerve wracking and I have to lie to people and it's, it's, it's just all kind of scary. And I said, well, you know, if, if you get a job you don't want, I, I would love to try my hand at it. And I was almost kind of, I was kind of joking, half joking. And he was like, oh, if you really mean it, I think I could probably get you on some jobs. And I was like, oh man, Okay. So a security assessment company offered Jack a contractor assignment to try to physically break into a building that they had permission to test the security on. I went in to do this uh, test and I got in on my first try, which was wild to me at the time because a secure facility is secure, right? Uh, and that, that became clear to me that that wasn't always the case. So I... I got in and I got back out to my car and I called my friend back and I was like, I need more of this in my life. I am addicted. I've been doing this for three or four years now. But the thing that surprises me about that story is that you you basically did it without any real security or any real training at all to, to know how to do this. Is that how I... Well, that is, that is correct. I am, I am an APT, my friend, with no training... <laughs> <laughs> what makes you feel like you have what it, what it takes to do this or what it does it take to do this? That is a really interesting question. So in order to do physical penetration testing or social engineering, I think the biggest quality a person has to have is confidence that you can do it. I can break into that building. I can convincingly lie to someone because if you are not confident, that comes off in the way you hold yourself and the way your voice sounds. It becomes unconvincing to other people if you don't believe it yourself. So I think my time as my time in theater and my time in journalism, learning how to talk to people, learning what questions to ask, how to put people at ease, that probably is what set me up for a successful career in physical penetration testing and social engineering. Actually, I've heard this before. Jack said she had a background in theater as well as journalism. And other penetration testers have told me to get good at social engineering, take an improv class or an acting class, because there they'll teach you how to become someone else and be convincing. You'll learn how to react to really zany situations and be able to get through it cool and calm. So yeah, acting does play a big part in sneaking into places. Now, if you couldn't tell, Jack is female, and she sometimes uses this to her advantage while doing these social engineering missions. She also uses different costumes. Yeah, so I I have several different disguises that I can I can switch out my appearance relatively quickly on site if I need to. Um, so I have wigs, I have glasses, I have um, di different changes of clothes, things that I will be able to remove and apply quickly, different types of, of makeup and maybe like a prosthetic um, 
mole or something along those lines. But my favorite toy, my favorite tool that I use on these engagements that if I can use it, I do, is my pregnancy prosthetic. I have a big belly that is filled with silicone and it has um, Velcro straps that I will use to wrap around my waist and uh, stick it to my stomach. And it makes me go from this 125 pound, pretty unimpressive person to, oh my goodness, I am eight months pregnant. And would you please get the door for me? (laughs) And when I have that option and I do use it, it works 100% of the time. Oh my gosh, that's so evil. Now I see why she's Jack Hyde. Dr. Jekyll is a good person, but Mr. Hyde is sometimes shockingly evil. I mean, can you imagine seeing a woman who's eight months pregnant coming down the hallway, holding her back and her belly, asking you to kindly hold open the door, and you just close it in her face and say, badge in like everyone else, lady. It's like, what are we supposed to do in these situations? One of the things that I think most pregnant women or men who have had pregnant women in their lives uh, have experienced is pregnancy brain. And so I can uh, pretend like, oh man, I, I'm, I'm feeling foggy, you know, pregnancy brain. I've forgotten uh, my badge or I've forgotten this piece of information. Oh my goodness. Can you believe I cannot remember my password? And people are very sympathetic to that. And again, it's exploiting the human factor. People are very eager to help people who are in distress, not just pregnant women, but older people or somebody who is either disabled or maybe they're temporarily injured and they have a cast or they're in a wheelchair or something along those lines. We want to be helpful people. And That's what a lot of bad guys take advantage of. You have these uh, scams against older folks all the time who get calls supposedly from their grandkids. Grandma, I'm in jail. Or Grandpa, I'm in the hospital. I need money. And that's what we try to emulate is this malicious actor who doesn't care about people's feelings. They're just in it for themselves. It's true. A lot of scam artists do target the weak and elderly people who have no chance against them. It's evil and sick. Okay, so I'm properly freaked out now already by Jack. I'm confident that she's evil enough to do something crazy to get into any building. So let's go along with her on a mission. A physical penetration test. A social engineering engagement. A red team assessment. We were hired to do a a physical for international manufacturing business, um, the, the way a lot of companies do their headquarters is they'll have a headquarters in, in different countries if they're an international corporation. And so this particular headquarters uh, was in a Spanish-speaking country, and it was where we were hired to do this physical. It was a Spanish-speaking country, and I do not speak Spanish. And so uh, when, when I heard that there was a physical component to this test, and they wanted us to plan a rogue device, I was like, okay, we got to bring Carl on. Carl not only uh, focuses on the rogue devices and, and drop boxes, as we called them at the time, but he is also a Spanish speaker. At least, at least a little bit, not <laughs> to get by, which is what was necessary for this one. I'm, uh, I'm Carl. Um, I basically do the, uh, the hardware and our rogue device side. So Jack essentially uh, gets me into the building and then I install the devices. And so we've been on several of these uh, little trips together now and it's, it's been a good time. And so the story we're uh, about to recite is one of my actual first physicals. And so there's a certain aspect to the, the emotion of that. And when you're used to being a nerd behind a computer for so long, then you're out in front of the adversary. It's a little, it's a little different. So the objective is to break into this manufacturing plant in a Spanish-speaking country, plant a rogue device so that they can try to use it to hack into the company and then get out. They have permission from the head of security to conduct this intrusion, which is to assess the security of the facility. The team consists of Jack Hyde and Carl. Jack is a physical penetration tester. She's an expert at sneaking into places that she shouldn't be in. And Carl is the hacker. He's an offensive security certified professional, which is a training course and certification that teaches you how to hack computers. 
He's a coder, and he knows his way around operating systems really well. But most of all, Carl has a real passion for computers and breaking into stuff. So the two together make a very dangerous pair. So when we get a client, the first thing I want is an address of the building that they want tested. And then the first place I go after that is Google Maps. I am looking at this from bird's eye view, satellite images. I'm looking at it from the street view. I want to know everything I can just looking at the building from the outside. And what I found looking at this building on Google Maps was that there was basically a fence or a wall on surrounding the thing. It was not just any fence. It was actually a palisade style fence with like this curved top and this like three pronged, very aggressive topper. There were two entrances to get into this building, one for trucks and deliveries, and the other was for workers. From Google Maps, she could see that these two entrances had a guard shack right next to the entrance, which would watch that everyone used their badge to get into the turnstile and into the building. This was this was a pretty aggressive um, security situation where there was pretty intimidating fence, there was a, a guard checkpoint, And I found photos of the badge readers online because people post everything on social media. And so I knew what kind of badge system they were using. Jack's first thought was, okay, maybe they can find a nearby coffee shop, see somebody with the badge to this place, bump into them casually, clone the badge in the process, and then walk away. But when she started getting the badge cloning devices together, she had second thoughts. This stuff, (laughs) this stuff looks kind of intimidating and you don't want to be carrying it through uh, airport security in countries where things might not be as safe as they are here in the U.S. So unfortunately, bringing my badge cloning equipment wasn't an option for this particular job. And so we were going to have to figure out, we were were like, okay, maybe, maybe there's a way that we could like jump over this fence. (laughs) Maybe if we found like a tree or a dark spot, you know, it did, it wasn't, it didn't seem particularly well lit at night. And so I was like, okay, maybe, maybe jumping this thing might be an option. It wasn't concertina wire. and, And I'm, I'm a relatively, we both are relatively, um, physically fit people and so we we were kind of playing with that idea and we were like okay that's that's definitely an option jack and carl did some more passive reconnaissance and decided to fly to the location to try to find a way in they arrive and decide to scope out the place from a distance to see if they could find any weak spots in security where they could just sneak into the building when we got there though we perform on-site reconnaissance. And when we got there, we realized that this guard, there were like three guard booths around the facility and they were all manned 24 seven. On top of that, there was like a police watch that did rounds around this facility and the neighborhood around it at night. And so that we knew right away, we're like, okay, there's no way we're jumping this fence. <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. Okay, Hmm. the manufacturing company seems to have their security in order. Lots of cameras and guards and fences and turnstiles and only two entry points. Gosh, this is going to be hard. Walking in off the street doesn't seem to be an option here. And you're not going to get in this building without a badge. And if you try to go up and lie to the guard who may not even speak your language and you get caught, the whole engagement is blown. And potentially face angry law enforcement officers and guards whose language we don't speak. (laughs) Or... (laughs) Or they can use a completely different strategy to get into this place. So we started uh, looking at our options, and this was kind of the plan B that we had been building up before we got in country that we were going to lean back on if we decided that that like a more covert infiltration wasn't going to be an option. And so when I was doing reconnaissance, I looked at a lot of social media accounts. I looked at LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram is a big one. And just playing Google, Googling your company in the country it's in. And what I'm looking for is a mark 
In social engineering lingo, a mark is the victim person, a person who you think is just gullible enough to be tricked into doing something for you. Jack is going to do a bamboozle on someone, and she needs to find that perfect victim. She's going to places like LinkedIn and seeing what people are into. She's looking for people who might be somehow eager for acceptance, or they show a lot of vanity, or maybe there's just somebody who's really greedy. If Jack can find someone like this, she can try to trick them into doing work for her. And after researching this long enough, she found someone, a mark, who she chose because of their idealism. So this person had single-handedly put together a coalition of their coworkers and started up a food bank. And he convinced them to not only volunteer at this food bank, but donate their their time and resources to help building it up. Uh, and they become a movement in their community to help feed the hungry. And that became where I focus my attention on these people. I think I just saw Jack turn into Mr. Hyde. She's choosing the people who set up a charity as her mark. She's planning on exploiting their caring and good-hearted natures so she can get into this building. Ooh, that's evil. So uh, we built up this pretext that I was uh, a woman named Bridget and Carl was this guy named Ted. And we were both involved in the department of our company back at the headquarters in the United States. And what we did was we put a fish together, a phishing email, with a domain that looked a lot like our target company's domain. Instead of targetcompany.com, it was targetcompany-communityresources.com. And then Bridget and Ted, these two fake people, kind of went back and forth talking to each other, talking about this conference that was going on in that country for our company. And we were talking back and forth as if we were going to this conference. Um, hey, Ted, are you going to that conference in November? And he was like, yeah, the whole family's coming. Well, we're looking forward to it. I'll see you there. And I would respond, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, we should swing by and see, see our offices, our, our headquarters in country while we're there. And he says, yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Actually, there's a team there that put together a food bank that I would really love to meet. So now Jack is acting like Bridget, and Carl is acting like Ted, and they are both acting like they help with charitable activities from the corporate office in these emails. But so far these emails have only gone back and forth between Jack and Carl. This is just to build up the pretext. See, a pretext is a cloak. It's a disguise that hides who you really are. And it has to be believable. So by sending emails back and forth between them, it builds this up because they are about to forward the whole email chain to the mark. So I said, the day before we were planning this breach, hey, Ted, have you reached out to that team yet? Because, like, you speak Spanish, and I thought you were going to go ahead and see if we can maybe go go meet these awesome people who created this awesome food bank program. And Ted goes, oh, dang, I hope we aren't too late. Like, we are, we're not in the country for very much longer. And so he puts together this fish in Spanish, and he goes, hey, my name's Ted. I'm a project manager based out of the headquarters for our company in the States. And I heard about the inspiring work you're doing, and we're really proud. Put in a line uh, to the extent of if you can't feed 100 people, but just feed just one from uh, Mother Teresa. And... That, that really connects, to, you know, it's a good sentiment in any case, but it really brought the entire fish together and it just sits there nicely at the bottom of the email and, and just, you know, it's like putting a, the bow on top of the present. And uh, that's uh, essentially the, uh, the the picture that we were trying to paint is we're very interested in this food bank and we were similar minded individuals that uh, had a, a same similar goal of community outreach and we were interested in seeing the location there. Okay, honestly, would you fall for this? We often shame people who fall for phishing scams, and we say things like, I would never fall for something like that. But imagine if you had poured your heart into starting something, and now some big-time people are contacting you wanting to meet. You might just be so excited that you miss the little signs, like the email address isn't right, or that this email has a sense of urgency to it. 
We're all a little narcissistic and we want others to appreciate the work we do. And something like this feels like you're finally getting that recognition that you deserve. Especially when Bridget and Ted have actually researched a lot about what you do and seem to know exactly what you've been doing. This is not some mass email. This one is extremely personal and targeted. I think anyone would have a really hard time defending against this. Now, they send this email chain to the mark. And the mark works in this building that they want access to. This email did not contain any malware or shady link. It just asked if they're willing to meet. After they send the email, they wait. And keep in mind, they're already in the country, not too far from the building that they're trying to break into. And they're just sitting at the hotel crafting this whole scheme. And after the break, we'll hear what their reply was. After Jack and Carl forward the email, they wait for the reply. They replied within minutes. Uh, saying, oh my goodness, yes, we would love to show you around and tell you about our program. We can, you know, I want you to meet all of these different people on the team and we can show you where we pick up donations. And they were, they were just extremely enthusiastic. This was exactly what Jack and Carl were hoping for. They couldn't sneak into the building, but now they've got someone inside inviting them in and willing to show them around. These two are evil but really good. (laughs) This did impact Carl. He thought this was messed up to exploit someone's good nature like that. That was the biggest thing that was the hardest to shake out of my mind. And I guess the mantra that you keep on going back to is, you know what? If a good guy can do this, a bad guy can do this. And if a bad guy can do this, the ramifications are going to be far more severe. Yeah, you know, I guess it it shows you that you're human. You know, it matters that you're you're making those connections. You're using a, a method like this and it kind of sucks, but uh, if it makes the client better and it means that a bad guy can't perform a similar action, then I, I guess that's why we do this. So while it didn't feel right, they went along with it, using a slimy but solid exploit, the charitable side of humans. Okay, so this Mark and these people that they're exploiting are overjoyed that someone from corporate wants to see their food bank that they started at work, that they actually offer a car to come out and pick Jack and Carl up from the hotel. So they agreed to be picked up the next day. But now Jack and Carl have a lot of work to do. They need to really become Bridget and Ted as best as they can. And in fact, they picked two people who actually did work in the company named Bridget and Ted in an attempt to blend in even better. So in the previous two days, we had some extensive, extensive study time into these personalities that we were developing and uh, going as detailed as, OK, we'd quiz each other. Where did I go to college? Like, what's what's my wife's name? What's my husband's name? Uh, what did I study? Favorite activities? And it was a, a huge cram session and you're just kind of hoping that you're, that all that fit into your head and you're hoping that the right fact is going to come out of your mouth at the right time. The next day comes. The mark or the employee at the company sends a car to come get them. But to throw them off, they have the car sent to a different hotel. That is exactly what happened. So they offered to pick us up and we didn't want to bring them right to where we were just in case things went wrong. And uh, they figured out that we were not who we said we were while we were still in the country. We didn't want them to connect us back to that. And we were staying at like a medium rate hotel and we had them pick us up at the nicest hotel in town. (laughs) And uh, the driver drove us to that site, the, the headquarters, and we were given visitor badges, which were RFID visitor badges. And just like that, we were let in. Let me just back up for a second. When I was trying to think of a way into this building, I never would have thought that somebody was going to come pick them up at the hotel and take them into the building and give them valid badges to get in and show them around. This is unbelievable. Honestly, uh, there was a moment where we didn't know if... We were walking into a trap. If maybe they figured out what we were doing or that we weren't who we said we were, because we we just picked out people on LinkedIn who we kind of looked like, who did the jobs of the people we were trying to pretend to be. And there was always the chance that maybe, maybe they reached out through internal channels and figured out that we were not who we said we were. And so there was a tense moment 
right as we walked inside, right as we were about to be greeted by our mark, where we weren't sure. But then, you know, they welcomed us with open arms and were extremely excited to have us there. So it was clear that they they trusted us. We were who we said they they thought we were who we said we were. Uh, and for the next like three or four hours, we hung out with these people. Now, when they came on site, Jack had a small purse and Carl had a backpack. Jack didn't have anything special in her purse, but Carl had a rogue device and a laptop, and he was constantly looking for a moment to get away and to go plug this into the network and try hacking into the place. But the team kept giving them a full extensive tour of the whole facility. In this three or four hours when we were in the building, we're talking with them about community outreach and all of this, and uh, it in a way, that kind of made it easier because being genuinely interested in that, it, it comes from the heart. So it makes you uh, come off more uh, more genuine. And, and I don't think they really suspected too much there. Had we had to talk about something too scientific, like uh, like nuclear propulsion or something, we probably would have been out of it a lot faster. So it was nice to, to kind of have a pleasant chat. But, you know, going back to what we were saying before, you kind of have that sitting in the back of your head like oh man am i just a terrible person for being here right now because what you're saying it's got like a triple layer cake like what you're saying is true and you actually believe it but that middle layer is while i'm here for doing something completely different i'm actually malicious even though i'm talking about a good subject right now then you get that third tier like well you know what it's 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 for the best anyways and so there's there's a ton of emotion um going to you at the time uh but uh, it was pretty extensive about three or four hours yeah, and, and we were, I'm, I'm actually kind of lucky that it was, uh, we, we did speak different languages. Um, you know, Carl and I speak a little bit of Spanish, he more so than I, and they spoke a little bit of English. And so if there was any awkwardness or a difficulty communicating, you know, if, if we slipped up a little bit, there was, there was always that language barrier that we could fall back on. Like, Oh no, you must've misunderstood me. (laughs) They're there hours and hours on site, but their hosts were so good that they never let Jack or Carl out of sight the whole time. And even when like one of us tried to excuse ourselves to go to the bathroom, there was somebody popping up who was like, Oh, let me, you know, let me, let me show you where to go. And I was like, are you going to come to the bathroom with me too? But they, they didn't. Um, so as we're walking out, I'm like, dang it, there's just no, like, I can't, I can't get away. At this point, the tour is over. And the host took Jack and Carl to the front door to say goodbye and to turn their badges in. Drats, they thought. They spent all day here and didn't accomplish what they came to do, which was to plant that rogue device somewhere. <sighs> Think quick, what else can you do? They're now at the front, at security, about to leave the building, and the guard is asking them to turn in their badges. Carl handed over his badge, and I legitimately, for about two seconds, had misplaced where where I put my badge in my bag. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to run with this. And I was like, oh no! I I seem to have lost that visitor badge you gave, you gave me. I misplaced it. I must have left it somewhere. And so I'm just standing there looking casual. I'm maybe putting the right amount of distress in. Like, oh no, you lost your badge. That's so rude of us visitors. We should know better. And they were like, oh, no, no problem. No problem. It's fine. Yeah, you know, thank you so much for coming to visit and keep in touch. I was let out a, a larger gate towards the side of the building and... We were, we were home free, and I also had a visitor badge. The hosts arranged a driver and a car to take them back to that fancy hotel that they weren't actually staying at. They get let out, and they take their guest badge back to their hotel room and plan out the next steps. They now have a complete layout of the building, since they were given an extensive tour of it. They know their way around pretty well now, and they have a badge that will let them in through the courtyard gate and through the turnstile and into the building. They also know the itinerary of the host that gave them the tour and know exactly when they'd be tied up the next day. So they waited until the next day to revisit the site, this time unchaperoned. We were able to return around mid-morning when they had mentioned they were going to be 
in meetings all day. They both arrive at the building and walk up to the turnstile. And they know that when you swipe it, one person's allowed through the turnstile, which kind of makes it impossible to tailgate someone. Well, I think what we did that at the time, I think there was there was either nobody in the booth or they weren't looking the right way. So I know that I was super nervous about this. And I went through and I used the badge first. Carl gets in. And he turns around and hands the badge back to Jack. She swipes it and she gets in. Now they're both in. No problem. They did not have a one swipe, one entry protocol with their badge readers. So we were both able to get in with the same card by just passing it back through the turnstile. <laughs> <laughs> so now their only objective here is to plant that rogue device in the network and leave. This rogue device is like a Dropbox. It has a way for Carl to access it from outside the building and to get into it. And if that device is on a good network port, this would allow him to try hacking into the network all night long safely from his hotel or from anywhere in the world. He just needs to find a good spot to stick it. From our tour the day before, we had noticed that there were some conference rooms uh, that were that were um, fully occupied and we couldn't get away from our hosts anyways. But this next day, uh, because fortunately there were extensive meetings, a lot of these conference rooms were empty. Jack and Carl pop into one of the conference rooms and close the door. Carl quickly starts pulling gear out of his backpack. The rogue device, a laptop, some cables. We are trying to look as normal as possible. So I have Carl sitting on one side of the table and I, um, I was playing lookout, but as casually as possible. The rogue device that Carl pulls out is an Odroid C2. It's a mini computer about the size of a pack of cards. It runs Linux. It's kind of like a Raspberry Pi. And he's customized it to give it like a mobile internet connection. So as soon as it's powered up, Carl can connect to it from anywhere in the world. So then he takes the internet port and plugs it into a network port in this conference room. But he's not seeing much traffic go by on this port. If I don't see substantial traffic that makes it worthwhile and not enough hosts, it's it's just, it's not going to be worthwhile. Uh, so for example, if there are a lot of uh, Cisco phones and there aren't any like Windows workstations or Linux servers or just just a sparse amount of traffic in general. If I if I don't have a point to or any data to leverage my device on in the network, there there's there's no point in planning it there. Often what corporate offices do is have a separate network for phones and for workstations. And a phone network is often locked down to just allow phone traffic through. Carl is using a program called TCP Dump to watch what traffic is being broadcast on this network. He's just seeing phones. Rats, this port's not going to work. He might be able to find a better port somewhere else that has a lot of workstations or servers plugged into it. And I know that I have to essentially pack everything up. And then tell Jack, like, well, hey, I'm sorry. We're going to have to go on to the next room. And then we just try the next one. They pack up and casually leave the conference room. They find another room and go in that. Again, Carl unloads his gear and Jack acts casually and keeps a lookout. Carl connects into his Dropbox and begins his attack. Yeah, so so when we first get on the um, log into the Dropbox, we just want to see what's going across the wire. Uh, so a lot of it is really passive listening. And so I'm not actually giving myself an IP initially. Uh, I'm just passively listening, layer two, layer three, and watching stuff go by. We wait as long as, campaign time-wise, as long as we can afford to wait. It's kind of a gamble based on within that one or two minutes, I'm looking at the traffic. If I decide, yeah, we'll go with this one or no, let's try the next one. And then I'm looking at MAC addresses flying by. I'm looking at what kind of uh, workstations, if we're looking at like Linux boxes, if we're looking at uh, Windows 10, Windows 7. Uh, and then I will, uh, when I feel like dropping down to the wire, I'll statically assign an IP and just uh, I'll drop myself down and then change the MAC address to make myself look like the workstations I've been observing. And then also uh, change the, uh, the TTL. So if I'm pinged, I'll also look like a... Uh, Windows workstation instead of having it come back as Linux. But again, nothing good is on this port either. He's not seeing any workstations or servers or anything interesting as he's listening to what's on the wire. (sighs) This isn't going to work. Maybe he can find something better. So the team once again picks up all the gear and goes to find another room to try again. They're starting to get a little worried that the conference rooms might be all locked down. Well, there's a little bit of fear that starts to eat at your mind a little bit. Like, oh no, but each one in this floor might be might be a dead port. But 
The third one, something was different. Uh, I did notice in the first two, the port was a little bit dustier, but I thought, you know what, we're here. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try it. The third one, the port looked a little bit cleaner, which is probably a better signal that people have been plugging in and out of it. Uh, and it, it worked, <laughs> and uh, I was pretty pretty relieved. After the third conference room, when Carl plugged in, he immediately saw workstation traffic. Bingo. This is the port he was looking for. From here, he could probably gain access to one of those workstations and then keep pivoting up to main servers. And he'd be able to do all this from his hotel or even back home in the office. And their plan is just leave this device and do just that. Because it's too risky to stay in this conference room for hours and hours and hours trying to hack into the place. So it's best to leave the rogue device, get out, and then hack into it later. Uh, And then it's a matter of obfuscating the device as much as possible to to make it blend in and look like it kind of belongs there. Uh, Luckily, there were a a fair amount of cables underneath the table. Uh, You know, in some businesses, you like to look all clean and tidy, but in our scenario, we love it when people just leave trash everywhere and and have cables going all over the place and just terrible cable management. I can uh, tuck a device in there and it'll it'll look uh, pretty benign and If we're lucky, uh, we'll sometimes find on site some stickers from rummaging around uh, from the IT department that we can slap on there and make it look official, or we'll print some out ahead of time that'll say company name, IT department, please don't remove, and it makes it look a little bit more official. With this rogue device in place, hidden neatly under the table amidst the rat's nest of cables, the team packs up and begins heading out. This is all they came to do, so it's time to leave. Yep, yeah, it's time to pack up and walk out casually and and hope that you don't get uh, caught on the the one-yard line before you get into the end zone, really. Uh, So (laughs) that that would be the most, just the worst thing possible is have somebody stop you while your device is planted and just trace everything back and and have your campaign fail at that moment. So uh, we casually walk out, and that was that. They even give their visitor badge to the guard on the way out, since it felt like the end of their mission. And at this point, they had an Uber come pick him up and drive him back to the hotel with a feeling of accomplishment. Well, it's a it's a feeling of success as far as you know the, the time that I was given to build this device. The device works. The time I was given to research this location that's paid off. Uh, the trust put into me and the client to perform this and the in their interest and in perform a service that's worked. So I guess just it's a relief of, you know what, uh, wherever, whatever we can do remotely to, to this device, that's that will be what it will be. But uh, as far as the physical goes, we've earned, you know, we've earned what was spent to bring us here. And we've uh, kind of upheld our end of the bargain. And so that feels good, and especially being my first physical and not being very used to twisting people and and creating the mirage and all of that it it kind of felt good to not be arrested in a foreign country in my first attempt we were in the car afterwards and i'm i'm like i'm feeling the rush i'm like yes we did it i feel i feel good about this like we we got our teammates back home the access that they need and i look over at carl and he's just got his head in his hands I was like, what's wrong? And he was like, those poor people. That that really kind of weighed heavily on me. Oh, man, our hosts were so gracious and they were so passionate about their project that it, it felt bad that underneath it all, I, we were essentially lying to them about our purpose there. And that's something that even with X amount of rationale, it's, it's an inescapable feeling. It was, it was kind of a wake up call moment for me. I was like, I, and I knew, like, I knew what we were doing was, was not great, but I, I'm glad that he, you know, recalled me to that because I've been doing this for so long. I sometimes can, can lose sight of that. Uh, and he, he keeps me grounded, but I, and that was exactly what I told him was, look, you know, we, we are pretend bad guys and there are real bad guys out there. So we can, we can feel bad about this. That's fine. Um, but we're, we're a vaccination and shots suck. Using the rogue device, the team did find more vulnerabilities in this network, which got them domain administrator access into the network. So even though it's a uh, current year, uh, sometimes people still have unencrypted credentials flying around their network. And so with sufficient amount of uh, monitoring on the wire, uh, credentials were recovered that allowed 
us to uh, pivot into multiple systems. Uh, and then we eventually escalated up to uh, DA and we were able to extract all of the valuable information that uh, you're looking for in a, in a situation like this as far as credit cards and PCI and, and, and all of that. So. so all within a few days of recon and a few days of actual exploitation, this team successfully got in, put their rogue device in and gained full access to the network. Incredible. The team wraps up their findings and puts it all into a report and gets on a conference call to explain everything to the client, who's the head of security for this organization. So there's always a little bit of awkwardness. There's always a little bit of shock. I think a lot of people assume that it's going to be, it's going to end up better for them and speak better of their security than it ends up being in this particular case. It was very personal because it involved very little of their physical security. Their physical security uh, held up quite well under under the circumstances. If we were malicious actors in country, uh, there's there's a potential that we could have made our way covertly past their their security. But what we did was we exploited the human factor, and that hurts a little bit more. Um, and so we not only had to explain the situation to the, the folks who received our report, but then they had to go down and debrief this team. Now, because the team felt bad that they exploited these people, they tried to make something positive from all this. And they really pushed hard to have the corporate headquarters connect with this food bank project and get acknowledgement and help from corporate. And that did, in fact, happen. The headquarters was happy to see the food bank project, and they helped give it more resources and recognition to make it even more of a success. And in this particular case, the big thing that they could improve was their security awareness within the company, doing things like double-checking domain names. When people put pressure on you to like do something quickly to give them access to a piece of information or a file or a physical location quickly, that should raise some red flags for you. And that's exactly what we did in this case was we showed up in country and said, hey, we're only going to be here for a couple more days and we're off to this conference. So if you want to meet us and you want this, this food bank project to be noticed and maybe get a little bit more funding for it, you need to meet with us soon. You need to give us an answer soon. And we we took advantage of that. And you know what? The people who started this food bank project, the Marks, that got social engineered by Jack and Carl, this is a story they're always going to remember. And this is a story they'll share with everyone. A story like that will certainly travel around the company about the two evil penetration testers who exploited such good people. And whoever hears the story will think twice about what a bad guy is actually capable of. These people still work on their food bank project, but now they validate their guests a little closer before showing them around. So hopefully this is a good lesson they learned, which at the end makes security a little better. You've been listening to Darknet Diaries. A big thanks to Jack Hyde and Carl for sharing this amazing story with us. You can follow Jack on Twitter. Her handle there is H-Y-D-E-N-S-3-3-K. Oh, and about this podcast, I'm about to rebrand this whole thing. New podcast artwork, new website, new stickers, everything. I'm super excited about that. So look for it soon, TM. Want to discuss this podcast with other listeners? You can. You can join us over at Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash darknetdiaries or on Discord at discord.io slash darknetdiaries. See you there. This episode is created by me, the one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple packet eater, Jack Recider. And the theme music was created by the shrimp sampler, Breakmaster Cylinder. See you in two weeks.